tēnā tātou. Nō mai heire mai. Nō mai heire mai ki tō tātou whare pupuri taonga ko te ahuriri te whare nei. Nō mai o te taua moana. Greetings to you from the Navy. Nō mai o Ngāti Tumatauenga. Greetings to those of you from the Army. Nō mai o te taua Arangi. Greetings to you from the Air Force. Tēnā koutou, ngā uri o ngā hoia kua hinga i te muro o te ahi. Greetings to all of you, the descendants of those that have passed in the heat of the flame. Tēnei te timatanga o tō tātou hui, he karakia mō tātou. Ko te amorangi ki mua Ko te hapai o ki muri Te tūturu tanga mahi pono O te Māori mana motu hake Ai ai e koe te iti kahurangi Ki te tuohu koe mehe maunga teitei E hara taku toa i te toa takitahi E ngari taku toa he toa takitini I runga i te ingoa o te toko toru tapu Te atua matua tō tātua kaihanga Te atua tama tō tātua kaiwhakaora Te atua wairua tapu tō tātua kaiwhakamā E whakamā toru toru te tō mairangi ata whai ki roto i a tātou Te hau o ranga taha tīnana, te hau o ranga taha hinengaro, te hau o ranga taha wairua, ake, ake, amine. E kore rātou e koroheketia. Pēnei ia tātou, kua mahue ake nei. E kore hoki rātou e ngoi kore, ahakoa pēhea e ngā ahua tanga o te wā. I te heke ngā atu o te rā, tai noa ki te aranga mai i te ata, ka maumahara tonu tātou ki a rātou. Ka maumahara tonu tātou ki a rātou, we shall remember them. Thank you, Charles. Good evening, everyone. My name is Liz Reid. I'm an independent facilitator, and it's my pleasure to be chairing this meeting. It's my pleasure also to welcome Mayor Bill Dalton, councillors, members of the project team, members of the return services, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, this meeting is due to run for about an hour and a half. And I have to start by saying, if you belong to the car with a number plate BBL899 and you're a white car parked in Browning Street, you've left your lights on. So based on the duration of this meeting, I'm hoping that if you are in here, you're able to go and sort that out. Uh, a few details about tonight. The, the meeting is being videoed and is being recorded, and it will be available, uh, for those who haven't been able to attend the meeting, it will be available on the Napier City Council Facebook and YouTube channel tonight, and it will be posted on the website tomorrow. So if you want to go back and revisit some of the things that have been said, or if you want to let those who you know haven't been able to come tonight to 
have a have a look and a listen to what uh, is is said here tonight, then that can be available to people through the website, through the Council's YouTube channel and on Facebook. The purpose of the agenda for tonight is that uh, we will have a number of speakers and at the end of the, speak the, the speakers we will have time for um, comments and questions. This is an opportunity uh, for the working group to present the three options for the site for the War Memorial. And so that is the subject matter for tonight. And we will be very happy to take questions on the options at the end of the meeting. You also have uh, some of you already, and you can pick them up afterwards. There is a postcard available where you can actually um, provide comment on the back and you can indicate your preferred option on the other side of the card. In terms of the, the process, uh, I'm just going to cover off briefly the objectives for this meeting and there Mayor Bill Dalton is going to welcome you and give you some background to uh, the process that has got us to where we are today. Charles Ropatini, who thank you very much opened with our prayer, uh, will then talk about the history and significance of remembrance and memorials, and particularly in the context of this project. Then Sally Jackson, who is the Manager of Visitor Experience for Napier City Council, will uh, give you some details on the project team itself, the process that they've been working through, and the development of the assessment criteria by which uh, the site options have been arrived at, and then Brent Scott from Citrus Architecture Group will actually talk through the details of those site options with you. Then I will give you a brief summary of the feedback that's already been received because this is a process that started on the 19th of July. The process of public consultation and engagement finishes at the end of this week and this meeting is a part of it. But the process itself to consult on the three site options started uh, in the middle of July. So I will give you a summary of the feedback that's been received already. And then we'll take questions, and then I'll just quickly run through with you the next steps in the process. So without further ado, Mayor Bill Dalton. Oh, sorry, actually, I'm just gonna revisit, sorry. Just to be clear on the purpose of the session, it is to review the three options for the new site as proposed by the War Memorial Working Group, and then to take feedback. Thank you. Well, good evening, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for attending on this rather damp winter's night. I'm just going to spend a few minutes reminding us all of the journey that has brought us here tonight, and then I will ask for your opinions of which of the three alternatives identified by the working group is the best location for the War Memorial. That, after all, is the reason we are here. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1957, the War Memorial Hall was opened. It was a simple but striking round structure that was acclaimed throughout the Commonwealth. It was a true community hall. Attached to the building at the northern end was an outdoors, readily accessible wall of memorial plaques behind a pond that held an eternal flame. The location outside pro provided an opportunity for people to pay their respects in a dignified way and reflect on the sacrifice these people made. Now, I can't speak of the architect who's sitting right in front of me here because, uh, but, and what he intended, and I was only six years of age at the time, but it is likely there was some symbolism in having the War Memorial on the foreshore to remember the men and women who left our shores to fight for their country, to remind us that many lost their lives landing on beaches, and also the thought that people could look out to sea remembering those who would never return. From the start, the flame in the eternal flame was a problem and it would go out each time a decent gust of wind hit it. Later, it became a challenge for some to, ex to extinguish the flame every weekend. As early as the 1960s, 
the hall began to be tinkered with, much to the annoyance of the understandably very proud architect, Guy Tush. By the 1990s, the hall was in very poor shape. The eternal flame had been out for months. Some have suggested to me it was years, but I know it was for months. The pond was full of rubbish, and the building was crying out for maintenance. It was at that time, amidst great controversy, the decision was made to convert this community hall into a commercial conference centre. It was also at that time that the name War Memorial Hall was lost. The name was changed to the War Memorial Conference Centre and the building was significantly altered and the plaques and flame were incorporated into a much less accessible area inside the foyer of the building. So when we hear people saying that the War Memorial should go back to its original position uh, in the foyer of the War Memorial Hall, we need to remember that the memorial, f memorial flame, memorial and flame, were originally in a much more accessible place outside, and the War Memorial Hall became a commercial conference centre in the 1990s. The British War Memorial Trust makes it clear that war memorials, where possible, should be preserved in their original position. In our case, that is not possible. The trust does support the relocation of a war memorial where it is not accessible to the public for commemoration. Clearly, a site often not able to be accessed, accessible by the, accessed by the public is not appropriate for a war memorial. We were determined to make the war memorial accessible at all times. We certainly did consider a design that provided both cover and accessibility, but the end, at the end it became too difficult and frankly too costly. So roll on 2015 and the conference again was not fit for purpose. The conference centre was again not fit for purpose. It was a significant earthquake risk and did not meet the needs of modern conferences. And after a huge amount of research, design, and inevitably, inevitably compromise, the conference centre ha we have today was built. This council, this council simply took a no longer fit for purpose conference centre and turned it into a fit for purpose conference centre. At the same time, we were determined to make the war memorial accessible at all times. So in 2016, the council decided to remove the war memorial and flame from a busy, noisy, and at times boozy place that was often unable to be accessed by those who wanted to visit it and to look for a more appropriate home. A project team was formed that had the objective of assessing options for the permanent location of the new War Memorial. That team comprised myself, our Deputy Mayor Faye White, Councillors Graham Taylor and Kirsten Wise, and we were supported by council staff, uh, John Purcell, the President of Napier RSA, Dorothy Parkey, the Chief Executive of Napier RSA, Peter Grant, the President of Teradale RSA, Michael Fowler from the Art Deco Trust and local historian, and Brent Scott from Citrus Studios Architecture. And on a couple of occasions, we've been joined by Guy Natush as well. So our councillors, ladies and gentlemen, then went to work, out in their communities seeking feedback. Some of us wrote talking points to the paper. I wrote one suggesting we were considering Memorial Square as a site for the War Memorial. And opinions on social media and in the print media were generally negative towards that. Although a considerable number of people have told me privately they thought it was a great idea to have the Cenotaph and the War Memorial together in Memorial Square. And I still get that comment virtually every day. But in the end, 
it became quite clear that the public's preferred site for the War Memorial was on the foreshore adjacent to the conference centre. So the councillors listened to the people and that is why our preferred site at this stage is one adjacent to the conference centre on the southern side. By placing the memorial there, it retains its link with the original War Memorial Hall and is close to the area used as a parade ground for military occasions and also dawn services. It would also be close to the Veronica Sun Bay and the Great Lawn, which was reclaimed with rubble from many of the buildings that fell and killed so many in 1931. Both of these are memorials in their own right. The name War Memorial Hall was removed in the 1990s when it became a conference centre. And one option that is being considered is that the large structure, sometimes known as the ballroom, effectively the original War Memorial Hall, be named again the War Memorial Hall. In that way, for commercial reasons, the complex could be marketed as the Napier Conference Centre but the core of the venue would be the War Memorial Hall. It would be clearly marked as such and described as such. An explanatory panel could be provided in the foyer at the entrance to the War Memorial Hall, showing and telling the history and path the hall has taken. A legend could be provided alongside, in the foyer, alongside the door into the War Memorial Hall. So someone booking a conference or an event at the Napier Conference Centre could do so in any one of the meeting rooms, in the large exhibition hall, the small exhibition hall, the foyer, or the War Memorial Hall. Of course, some hirers may use the whole complex. My personal view, for what it's worth, is that this is a very elegant solution to an issue that has become highly emotive. Council, you'll have your turn, Ellen. Council has received a clear message that the most appropriate place for the War Memorial is the Marine Parade. We are listening to that message. However, much of the criticism of Council does lack some, some research. We are told the War Memorial must be returned to its original place inside the building. The original position was outside the building. We are told that the eternal flame must never be let go out. It has often been extinguished, sometimes for months. So as with all these things, those who oppose council actions are very vocal, and we need to remember there are a great number of people out there, often the silent majority, who are happy with the progress the city is making. And part of that progress is to have a very efficient conference centre. And recently at a function in the conference centre, not only did I receive a number of compliments about the venue, but one of the award presenters even stood up and co congratulated the city on such a great venue. And a large number of the people at that conference were from out of town and were staying, supporting our hospitality industry, our restaurants, our service stations. So as a council, we are listening to everyone, including the RSAs, including the relatives of the returned people we're listening to everyone. Those against, generally, we're getting the message through social and print media and those supported through private messages of support. So, and we've listened to the hospitality industry and the accommodation industry. So ladies and gentlemen, in summary, we have not forgotten our war heroes. We are wanting to remember them in a more accessible and dignified way. I remain totally convinced the returning of the War Memorial to a site adjacent to the War Memorial Hall is appropriate. I also remain convinced the naming of the original core of the building, the War Memorial Hall, is also appropriate. The Napier War Memorial Hall is a name previously lost that could now be reclaimed. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're seeking your feedback on the three sites <coughs> the Working Party has recommended and we look forward to your questions and comments on that subject. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Bill. I'd like now to call on Charles to come and talk about the historical significance of remembrance in memorial. And you're in charge of this piece of machinery now. Thank you. <coughs> A large part of this hui is about remembrance. And I've taken some time to look back previous to the memorial hall to identify the significance of the land that we are talking about. One of the first significant military parades to take place on the Napier foreshore was the presentation of colours to the 3rd Battalion Wellington East Coast Rifle Volunteers, generously gifted by Dr Delisle. The date was November 9th, 1898, the date was chosen to coincide with the Prince of Wales' birthday. The colours were presented by Mrs R. McLean on behalf of Dr Delisle, and the consecration was performed by the Dean of the Cathedral, Dean Hovell. The paper reported, the presentation of the colours yesterday was no ordinary ceremony, no simple imitation of a compliment to veterans who have won their way to honour through fields drenched in the blood of their comrades who have fallen. It is an incentive to the noblest deeds, the highest patriotism. It is the point around which the comrades will rally in peace or when adversity comes and black war clouds threaten the land. May 25th, 1899. To mark the birthday of Queen Victoria, the East Coast Battalion held a Trooping of the Colour, the first for a volunteer unit in New Zealand. The parade was followed by a feu de joie and gifting of a framed photograph, potentially this one here, of the presentation of the colours to Dr Delisle. August 9th, 1902. A military parade and church service was held to mark the coronation of King Edward VII and Queen Alexandra. The military assembled at the recreation ground and marched to Marine Parade. Again, the paper reported, the Maori of Omahu have been asked to perform a haka on the recreation ground, and owing to the shortness of the combined religions service, no choir seats are erected. The horsed tableau on reaching the recreation ground, turn off to the left into Faraday Street and remain there until the conclusion of the military function. Then the whole procession will reform and march to the Marine Parade via Clive Square and Tennyson Street. In Tennyson Street, the military veterans and cadets will open out and allow the procession to pass through their ranks thus giving the cadets an opportunity to have a view of proceedings. At Marine Parade, the civic festivities took place, followed by a citizen's ball, illumination, fireworks, and entertainment well into the night. The 29th of June, 1911, another royal celebration took place to mark the coronation of King George V and Queen Mary. However, this time, much more focus was towards the church and cathedral, with the sermon focusing on the holy anointing of the king and queen as the heads of the empire. While the troops were in the cathedral, the city band kept the public interested in stirring music, and the Hawke's Bay Highland Pipe Band contribute, it contributed its share of martial music. The Spit and Napier Fire Brigades paraded and headed by the city band, a preliminary march through the town was made. Later, the territorials formed up and the stirring march past took place along the Marine Parade. There were 512 troops in the march past accompanied by three bands and the two fire brigades along with a contingent of fire police. The band rotunda and balcony of the Masonic Hotel were central to the coronation celebrations. August 1914, war is declared. 
At the declaration of World War I, the people of Napier naturally congregated around the band rotunda at Marine Parade. Patriotic speeches and demonstrations were made and the combined garrison and city bands played patriotic music and national anthems well into the night. The public did not dissipate until well after midnight. October 1914. <clears throat> after much lobbying with the imperial government in London, Māori were able to participate in World War I. The official farewell for the East Coast contingent from Ngāti Puro and Ngāti Kahungunu took place on the Marine Parade. The Māori soldiers paraded from the drill hall along Beach Road to approximately where the hall is now, not holding rifles, but armed with taiaha in the traditional manner of their ancestors. The main farewell speech was given by Captain Taranaki Te Ua, who was the commander of the Māori contingent that went to the South African War and was from Waipatu. April 25th, 1915, the first Anzac Day. A year later, 1916, many thousands took part in the celebrations to mark the first anniversary since the landing at Gallipoli. A large crowd gathered at Clive Square long before the fall-in time of 2.30 p.m. The municipal band had pride of place, followed by veterans, at the head of whom was an old veteran carrying the Union Jack. Following these were the F Battery, Territorials, Drum and Fife Band, Boy Scouts and members of the National Reserve. The route was down Emerson Street, along Hastings Street, and then up Tennyson Street to the Band Rotunda. Large crowds of people lined the footpaths and watched the procession. At the Marine Parade Rotunda, there was another huge crowd where speeches were given and a service was conducted, concluding with the hymn, Lead Kindly Light, sung by the girls of Hukarere College. December 1915, one of the most famous World War I waiata is written. My great-grandfather, Tanga Tomoana, was walking along this very beach with his father, Praere. And Praere looked out to the ocean and he said, isn't that strange? This is the very ocean that connects us with our boys in Gallipoli and in France and in Belgium. And as they, re as they walked along, Praire spoke to his son about the traditional Māori concept of love being carried across the tide to our loved ones and then returning to the us. May 1920, the Prince of Wales visits. While in Napier, a military church parade took place where the Prince observed a march past from the balcony of the Masonic Hotel, with speeches being given from the rotunda where returned soldiers and cadets formed a guard of honour. The march past took place along the Marine Parade. 1937, the coronation of King George VI and Queen Elizabeth at the new sound shell. The coronation ceremony in Napier provided a brilliant and colourful spectacle. The ceremony at the sound shell began with an address by the Mayor, Mr Morse, after which the royal salute was given by a ceremonial platoon from the HMS Leith and another from the Hawke's Bay Regiment. At noon, the royal salute of 21 guns was fired from the HMS Leith, and the evening was one of joy and hilarity. The celebrations, including dances, fireworks, displays, and special theatre programmes. October 1940, Napier's first women's parade. An unofficial women's auxiliary corps was formed in Napier, born out of the Girl Guide movement. These girls received training in drill, clerical, canteen and signalling work and were instructed by members of the Legion of Frontiersmen and an initial muster of 40 women held their first parade 
at the sound shell. A letter to the editor in the Bay of Plenty Times in February 1935 says, Sir, I notice in your issue that the Borough Council is giving consideration to the erection of a bandstand on the waterfront. I was in Napier last week and was very interested in the sound shell which they have recently erected on the waterfront there. It is, so they say, the only one of its kind in Australasia. I regret that I was unable to have heard any performance in it, but I believe the sound carries on in an amazing distance and the results generally are remarkable. According to Major Miller of the Grenadier Guards Band, the bandstand is a thing of the past. He referred to the New Zealand bandstands as glorified pigeon houses or something of the sort. What he thought of the Napier sound shell, I do not know, but it must have pleased him very much. Would it not be wise to make inquiries as to the cost of a sound shell before spending money on an out-of-date bandstand? Now, I am a humble army bandsman, and I do find it remarkable that Napier's military ceremonies have revolved around a bandstand as the central point of focus. Urban design by necessity has seen the change from the ceremonial heart being the band rotunda to the sound shell. And in progressing with the times, military ceremony moved to the camp and larger parade spaces that are that could accommodate the Hawke's Bay Regiment. Since 1898, the space where the conference center, sound shell and connecting lawn is, has gained mana. The many parades held there have trampled the ground and instilled generations of civic and martial pride, as well as royal and chiefly presence. Through this process, we can look to the past to find a way forward as we continue to develop our city and knowledge those who have paid the noblest of sacrifices for our freedom. Memorials over time have developed and changed from cenotaphs to useful public buildings to works of art and sculpture, trees and gardens. As records become digitized and information becomes available, we have a responsibility to regularly revise our memorials and continue to ensure that all of those who have fallen are remembered. Last year, official numbers of New Zealanders at Gallipoli were reviewed, doubling the original number from 8,556 soldiers to well over 16,000. During my time managing New Zealand Post's World War I commemorations, the official numbers of the New Zealand Post and Telegraph Corps were revised to add another 256 names to bring the total to nearly 3,000 men. Through the efforts of many people, including the archivist here at MTG, Cathy Dunn, we have already uncovered close to 50 people missing from the World War I and World War II honour rolls. And we will come as close to a definitive list as possible. It is our family and civic responsibility to contribute to this process, to check our own beloved's name, rank, and post nominal, and to collectively ensure what we move forward with is as true and correct to the documents we now hold. This land has mana, and we will remember them. Kia ora. Kia ora. thank you, Charles. Uh, I'll now call on Sally, who is going to give some detail around the project team and the assessment criteria that's been used to determine uh, the options that are now being opened for public consultation. Thank you, thank you, Liz. So in establishing a new site for Napier's War Memorial, it has been really actually quite fantastic to bring together a group of highly motivated and passionate people to develop a solution for us to move forward. So I don't need to go through all of the names that you can see up here as Bill had them in his introduction, um, but it has been actually a really incredible experience to work alongside all of these different people. 
guy did join us at our last meeting um, and brought um, a fantastic amount of knowledge um, and expert assistance really into the group. External to the project um, group, we have also called on the advice of Heritage New Zealand, which has been really uh, useful as well. So the objectives, so the purpose of the group, um, if you have a look at the, the different points up here, they're pretty straightforward, to be honest, um, but a great deal of work had to be um, completed by the members in order to achieve these high-level objectives. The first bullet point you see on the screen now, assessing the options for a permanent location of the War Memorial. It involved a lot, as you would imagine, um, including the development of a very long list of possible sites. So the group started with numerous suggestions and they were pulled in from letters from the editor, from people um, making phone calls into the council, to emails. So that they started with this big long list um, and then re realistically that had to be cut down to a number of around about 12 is what we assessed. Once that list was created, the group then needed to develop and agree upon the assessment criteria. Um, and so we did, we did generate a significant level of criteria that we assessed every single one of them on. It was a big job. Um, and I'll just move to the next slide that detail those assessment criteria elements. Um, so accessibility, Mayor Bill did talk about accessibility being really important in his um, introduction um, and the group did definitely need to consider the degree of public access to each site as well as the ease of access for all members of the community. The group wanted a site that you can get to with ease and move around with no restrictions. That was one of the most the biggest bit of feedback that we received from the, the current site that was in the, the conference center, that they, people were restricted. They would turn up when conference was in mid-flow and they couldn't get access to that. Visibility, that was really important to the group. The group did not want a location that was hidden away. They were very strong on the memorial being something the community could be very proud of consideration of the impact of that memorial at night was also taken into account. Safety and security um, of the location, of course, is really essential. Um, and how upset do we get when we see our city assets being vandalised? So we needed to take all of that into account. The connection to pedestrian routes, the proximity and connection to those routes, routes through the city is essential. How people travel today isn't how we traveled 50 years ago. Um, so the group, again, that whole thing around restrictions and putting restrictions in place to prevent people from visiting sites, that needed to be considered. Uh, the ability to host memorial events on site was also considered and assessed by the group. Links to the dawn service and similar events were taken into account. Car parking, we don't really need to talk about the importance of car parking, but we all know it is important. Um, connection to the rising sun and sea was really significant. Charles, in his speech, talked about the importance of the sea and that connection to the, the memorial, and we really wanted that to be an important part of that site location. Inspiration that was created by each site, actually this was one of the most important elements that we considered. What the group wanted to create was a sense of significance when you got close to that location. We were in a meeting this afternoon, um, actually at lunchtime with two of the RSA presidents, uh, and I think it was you, Peter, who said, it needs to make the hairs stand up when you enter that site. It needs to have mana to, to basically make you realize you've reached somewhere of great importance. The historical and cultural considerations were considered throughout, and these have been touched on by Charles this evening. 
and the last two elements, which are slightly smaller there, the ability to stumble upon. So you as a tourist visit in a town, how nice is it when you stumble upon something that's really quite important to that community and it resonates with you? I remember being in Invercargill and stumbling upon one of their bits of artwork and it really actually touched something within me and made me feel something more for Invercargill. So having something, an artwork, a some memorial, something that really impacts on people's lives was really important. And having a degree of separation, we didn't want any confusion with this new memorial site with any other memorial site that's currently in the city. So as soon as the assessment criteria was established, the group was able to take those 12 locations that had been identified um, on that big long list and very, very quickly, nine were immediately discounted due to that criteria in place. I'll give you a couple of examples of those. Uh, the Veronica Bay, that was put forward as a suggestion. So we assessed it, but it was discounted due to the close proximity to it actually being a memorial of the earthquake and the, the people who passed away in the earthquake. So the confusion there wasn't ideal. A location up on the top of Bluff Hill was suggested. Um, but due to the significant accessibility issues with the Bluff Hill location, that was immediately discounted. Also, um, at the time of the uh, development of the assessment criteria, the council received a letter from the RSAs that noted within it that if the memorial could not go back to the conference center, then its preferred location would be somewhere along Marine Parade. So that focused the working group somewhat, and a detailed assessment was completed on the three remaining locations that we will be presenting to you tonight, all of which are, of course, located on the Marine Parade. So I'm now going to call on Brent Scott, who is from Citrus Studios. He has developed these high-level concepts for us to consider, um, and I'd like to hand over to him to take us through those locations. But thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so as Sally's mentioned, we've focused in narrowing in on Marine Parade, which has strong connection historically, as Charles pointed out, and the zone between the sound shell and the original War Memorial Hall has identified the limits of what we looked at. So the three side options, which I'm sure you've all seen on the website, are all in that zone. You can see them on this plan here. They run from the south, the sundial site, which kind of is the termination of the lawn where it meets the original skating rink and next to Veronica Sun Bay. Moving along, you get to the Tennyson Link site, which is a, a visual and possible physical connection between Tennyson Street, the coastal walkway and the viewing platform, up past the fountain and then reaching the floral clock site, which is the one at the northern extreme end, closest to the original War Memorial Hall. So looking at these three sites against the criteria, each site has positives and negatives, and we are considering tonight, really, how each of those sites, and in the course of the consultation the last week or two, how it handles accessibility, visibility, safety, meaning, all those sorts of things, connection with the sea. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these three here before we flick on to the images. So the Sundial site, in terms of access and visibility, you know, this is kind of where everyone ends up in Napier. If you're in town or if you're visiting, you always end in Marine Parade about here. Um, so very, very visible and accessible. There is a good pedestrian route through between the two, between the lawn and the skating rink, which takes you through a pathway to connect to the coastal walkway. And that's one of the main things that's changed in Napier, and especially this area of town. When the Memorial Hall was first built, there were old pools, there was no hotel. So now what we're looking at is the development of this end of town. Um, but also, more importantly, Marine Parade has grown towards the sea. Um, you might have seen the original photographs when they were put up. The Shingle Beach actually reached the Memorial Hall. There was no usable land, only beach there. So we now have 
a leisure facility which has been developed by council all the way along. We have the new rotary pathway, which in many ways become the heart and lungs of the city, and a lot of pedestrians use that, both locals and visitors, and it also now connects all these elements along P Marine Parade, and also the viewing platform is the, the newest item along that journey. So we're kind of looking at that context and how these three sites can help reinforce all that and make remembrance, the place of remembrance, more special, more accessible and more important in our city. Um, moving on to the Tennyson Link site. Um, historically, there's obviously a link through Tennyson Street down towards the current Memorial Square. Um, there's development in the last few years in the MTG. It's become an important core in the city. Um, and there is actually now a view link from Tennyson Street or the front plaza of MTG through, through the lawn to the viewing platform, which is quite a significant thing at the moment. Um, there's also a chance to link, I guess, town and sea through that route. Then moving on down to the floral clock, this is kind of typified by two things. One is the importance of the War Memorial Hall, now that is the original location, but also the pedestrian sort of promenade that runs around the lawn, so anyone taking time to consider life in general can just walk in a circuit around the lawn and you get a chance to approach the floral clock site and to pass through a memorial place. So I'll move on to the three images just to describe a little bit more detail. The sundial site first. So the sundial site, as I say, bisects those two places, the lawn and the skating rink. Um, one of the important elements to this site is the visual continuity from the sound shell to the conference centre, which is important to maintain. So any, anything that happened here would need to not block that. So this option is indicated as individual elements to make sure that you can still see and walk through that. Um, it does give you, it's a little bit hard to see in this image, but, um, oops, that's right, I've gone the wrong way. That one there. So walking through here is a pedestrian route where you can arrive in the archway of the original Art Deco connection into the skating rink, through the archway, and you can choose to walk into the skating rink or through the memorial elements and on through down the steps to the, the sea. Um, this is also obviously near the, the skating rink. This is where current Anzac Day ceremonies are held. So this site has that one option that some of the sites do not have. Tennyson Link. So for this to be considered a viable option, it probably is creating a new public square more than, more than a smaller memorial wall. It probably requires the likes of moving the cenotaph there and bringing those two elements together. So this would effectively become a new memorial square place in town, and it can then connect that link between city and the coastal walkway and the viewing platform. Floral clock option. So this option is described in the website you would have seen, takes the floral clock and relocates it to a, a better place, more visible and more healthy for plants. <laughs> and gives us a chance to carve out a special place for a War Memorial wall with a, the conference centre and Old War Memorial Hall as a backdrop. And again, having memorial elements. At this stage, we're not really designing those individual things. We're just talking about the attributes of the site and what makes it a good site. So the elements in the front of these sort of things here in the front again, need to be porous so you can see through them and walk through them, through the lawn and off to the sound shell. So they're the three sites that we're considering, um, and this is why we're here. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. Uh, in terms of the feedback that's been received, uh, I can report that up until today, through the Napier City Council website, uh, there have been two people who favour the sundial, eight the Tennyson link, and 29 in favour of the floral clock. 
In addition to that, Heritage New Zealand has written a submission to the Council and they're in favour of the floral clock. Uh, I have some examples of some of the feedback received and I think it's worth, um, so that you can hear what other people are saying, it's worth running through just some of it. Uh, on the sundial, um, one piece of feedback was, this option has the most space. Another piece of feedback on the sundial says, the area of the sundial has been used for dawn parades since yo for Yonkies donks. I'm not quite sure how long a Yonkies donk is, but <laughs> apparently that's how long it's been used. It is the only hard standing place that is large enough. All the others would require major work. Moving the floral clock would only lend ammunition to the naysayers. I see the floral clock option as merely a sop to tone down the grizzling. On the Tennyson link, uh, some of the feedback says, gives the memorial a space of its own while also creating another good link between town and sea. Also allows plenty of space for services and groups. Another piece of feedback on Tennyson Link. I think this sounds like the best option. It sounds like a great place to use and wouldn't have to involve moving any of the original landmarks. And lastly on the Tennyson Link, the floral clock and sundial should not be moved or lost. They are historic, and to lose these would be heartbreaking for many members of the community. The Tennyson link sounds like a brilliant way to link another section of city to the parade, but it should not sacrifice historically significant features of the parade, such as the sundial or the memorial arches, Veronica Sunbay or skating area in front of the sound shell. The feedback on, floral, on the floral clock site option includes these. The floral clock option seems to be the right choice, close to the original site and within a secure area that can easily be monitored. A fair and sensible choice, plus in, in an environment that gels with the original location. The floral clock is my preferred option as the site is very close to the original and those who in the past have visited often will have no trouble with the location. I do think that given the fact that there seems to be no protection from the elements in the artist's impression, that this should be an important consideration for the final design. I have visited numerous times and witness, witnessed people standing for quite long periods reading the lists of names. And lastly on the floral, floral clock, this area will provide an inspiring experience for all citizens, students and visitors alike about Hawke's Bay's wartime and peacekeeping history. In addition, the road reserve opposite the garden offers a safe all-weather space for those who turn out to commemorate those killed in war and also, those, and also honour those veterans and service personnel who march and take part in wreath-laying ceremonies on Anzac Day. So there's been some quite considered feedback received and people are putting a lot of thought into that feedback. So just quickly before we move to your feedback and questions on the site options, uh, it's worth talking about what happens next. As I said, this is a, this is a process that began uh, on the 29th of July to consulting with the Napier community on the options. Uh, by the end of this week, uh, the opportunity to give feedback will be closed. And after that, the project team will sit down with all of the feedback and analyse it and take it on board in their recommendations and report to Napier Council on concepts. Um, they will also be giving the council a good understanding of just what the feedback was. Now, it's worth remembering, as Brent said, the concepts at that stage that are reported, that are reported back are simply the attributes of the site. It's not the design. So once the council has made a formal decision on which site to proceed with, it will then, the project will then move to the design, the detailed design stage. Uh, and there will be another round of opportunity for people to give comment on the designs at that stage. Uh, that will be reported back to Napier City Council uh, for the final project plan and they will make a formal decision at that point. Um, the plan will then be implemented and the build will start. Um, it is highly unlikely that it will be completed in time for Anzac Day 2018. Uh, the council is adamant that this will be done right uh, and it won't be rushed. 
and so the decision making needs to have time and the project needs to have time to be implemented well. Uh, so it is unlikely, um, despite what was said in the paper this morning, it is unlikely that it will be completed by ANZAC Day next year. So now is your opportunity to ask questions and give us feedback on the, on the three options. I would remind you that this meeting is about formal consultation on the three options. There has been lots of feedback given to the council, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, on the other elements of the project and the process itself. That's not why we're here tonight. We're here to get your feedback on the three options. We have some roving microphones. Um, I would ask that if you have a question, you raise your hand. We will get to you with a microphone, and then you can ask your question. Um, so we have, where is, so if, have we got, questions from you for the project team. Up the back in the red, Fiona. This meeting could not be on a more significant date. 100 years ago, yesterday, that's when the Battle of Passchendaele started. New Zealand took the highest casualty percentage-wise. I was born and raised on those battlefields where memorials were really holy ground. Coming to New Zealand, I found that living in Napier, very touching to learn that the local population contributed personally to have their own memorial. And here tonight, we hear that the memorial had lost its use, it wasn't accessible. But what is not being mentioned is the, the connection, the emotional connection it has for all those families who contributed to it. It's being said it needs to be more accessible. We overlook the hundreds of people who saw the war memorial, who saw the flame while attending one other function. And that's how I saw it for the first time as well. We are being offered three different options, but really no one listens to the voice of the people who want the option where it was. Put it back where it was. And that's what people ask. So, so. I'm going to ask Bill to respond to that question. The simple answer is that it can't go back where it was. We can put it, we can put it in an area which we believe will be more accessible, will still honour the, 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 the fallen, it will be a place that is far better than having it inside a hall. One of the complaints we get as a council is people that come and visit Napier from out of, out of town to, and want to go to the War Memorial and see their relative's name up on the War Memorial and they can't see it because the place is closed up for the weekend. We are going to put that right. Fiona? Oh, have we got one over there? Sorry. Okay. Let's, we'll come here and then we'll come to you next. Thank you. Sorry? Does that mean that option one, where the memorial was, is where the memorial will be. Sorry? I'm sorry? Sorry, sorry could Jeremy, that? could you explain that again, please? I'm, I'm endeavouring to ascertain whether the conference centre area will be in some shape or form where the memorial will be reinstated. The options are the, are, the th are the three that have been shown tonight. So the floral clock, Tennyson link, and the sundial. Those are the three options. Therefore, I'm saying is it the floral clock? Thank you. Yeah, Thank the, you. The, the preferred option of the working party is in fact the floral clock. And just in case anybody's concerned about the floral clock, we have that obviously, as you mostly will be aware, that. That was donated to the city by A.B. Hurst, and we have spoken to all the Hurst grandchildren who are delighted with the idea it's going to be shifted, not forgetting it was shifted from a nice sunny spot in 1995 and put in a spot that made it difficult to grow things on it. So um, it, it, the Hurst family is very happy for that to be shifted down to the sunken gardens. Helen. Yeah, can you hear me? that go out from 
Firstly, I'd like to thank you people for all turning up tonight to, to this lecture that we've all had. And from what I'm reading here, we are being talked at yet again. And the people of Napier are being talked at yet again. It has taken four and a half months and counting for this thing to even begin to look like being resolved. And yet everything that I've bumped into in this city tells me that the overwhelming desire of people is to have the war memorial returned, if not to the building that, that uh, outsourced it, but at least to that area alongside it. Excuse me, now, sir. Now, what the hell with Excuse our me, representatives sir. can they not sir, with get all, with that? With all due respect, do you have a question about no, the I three? I okay. made an observation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a question up there. I thought... A question? So, Alan, thank you very much for speaking. And, you know, we've had many, many conversations, um, especially over the past couple of days. We wanted to bring a lot of information to you tonight. So if you feel like you've been lectured, it's because we wanted to take you through the process that we as staff members and the working group have been through. So you could understand the assessment criteria, the reason why we've looked at those locations. It's really important for us as council officers to be able to show you the process that we've been through. It's taken four months, Alan, because we wanted to get it right. It's important to us to serve our community as best we can, and we can't rush it. There are processes that prevent us from doing that. Oh, I completely understand. It's nothing personal. But it is actually... And that's why we've got this time now for questions and comments, and we welcome this, every... This process has been available since the 19th. Okay. So, Fiona, thank you. Does the council have a reason why this is the only public meeting? Why aren't you prepared to have what was mentioned several times in the paper, three public meetings, and even one suggestion was at both the Napier and Taradale RSAs? Les, the, the, this is one meeting, obviously, but we're talking about the desired site or the preferred site. Ellen's, Ellen's just said that it should be alongside the War Memorial Hall as it was or the conference centre, whatever we're going to call it. That's exactly our preferred option. The next, the next meeting will be to discuss the design. I mean, that's a process we're going through. We can't do it all at once. We've got to find out where we're going to put it before we can design it. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Sorry. Next question. Um, I'm new-ish compared to a lot of people to Hawke's Bay. I've been here about 14 years. Um, I was disappointed when the War Memorial was going to be enlarged, but obviously that was appropriate and it's necessary and times are changing. I guess my biggest disappointment, and I would think a lot of people here, is some of your options are fantastic and I thoroughly appreciate them and I think putting one near the clock close to the War Memorial is a, a brilliant idea. Um, but you said this started on the 29th of July, 19th, 19th. 19th. 19th 2017. Oh, sorry, sorry. The yeah. building took place for the changes probably more than two years ago. So why at that point was this not brought to our attention so that this meeting now didn't have to happen with so much angst for so many people. This could have been resolved a lot of time ago. I have to tell you, I think that's very fair criticism. I think that is fair criticism. Mm. Having said that, one of the things that we're also mindful of was to, because we were going to lose the use of the War Memorial and, 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 and or the, 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 the conference centre, um, and, and, and to be honest, it would be closed now and not generating income right across the city. And we needed to get on with the project because it was accelerated. We had always planned to go through a process, but it was accelerated because it was suddenly deemed to be earthquake 
prone and we had to do something about it. So it brought the process forward considerably. So we got on, we've done the job, and now we are consulting, and I think that's the appropriate way to go about it. Gentlemen up, the, gentlemen up the back, and then we'll come to you. Hello, thank you yeah. everyone for attending. As a, as a relative who has someone on the war memorial itself marked, um, I would like to ask for the original architect to make an opinion. I would like to hear him speak on what's been suggested, and if he could make an opinion, please. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, the gentleman's asking if Guy could make a comment as the original architect. Absolutely. Yep. Want to come up? No, we, you've been asked now, so if, if you don't mind. For your opinion. No, the, the, the gentleman deserves an answer on, your, on, on what you think of the options. Um, well, I'm sorry, but why is that? He's asked a question, he deserves an answer. I repeated the question. Precisely, exactly, absolutely. Does Guy want to speak from down there? Does he want to speak? Yeah. Speak to okay. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure it is, really, to stand here and look at within this building. At least this hasn't been altered. Um, <laughs> We designed this in 1976, the poor old memorial, um, 1956. Um, there is absolutely no question that the floral clock location is the most appropriate area for the Roll of Honor and Perpetual Flame to be placed with in view of the extensions of the original design. I say that because if you study the criteria on which war memorials um, Maybe in, if they are to be relocated or moved or altered in any way, the criteria of the War Memorial Trust United Kingdom, which is adopted and used by the Heritage New Zealand, if you study those, then there is no other place other than for them to be reunited with the building, which you can't move that to rejoin the role of honour wherever you were choosing it to go. All must be reunited on the same site or within as close a relationship as possible. If you can't link it up visually, it's got to have a continuity of vision so that the eye coming from, as you enter the forecourt of the centre, and may I use the term centre until we re reconcile the Thank argument <laughs> about <laughs> conference or war memorial. So, as you enter the centre across the forecourt, there needs to be a strong element, a strong view of the war memorial elements leading towards the original building that has its own entrance um, alongside the main entrance. I think you all know what I mean. Um, it, the original building 
had a curved wall attached to the building and followed around the building and then curved outwards in, to give some form to a pool and the perpetual flame. This perpetual flame was rather small. We try, tried our best to get it bigger, but in those days, Napier wasn't a big city, and the cost of running it perpetually loomed large, and any increase in cost for a flame that would res resist gusts of wind seemed to uh, never be considered a possibility. I always felt that, after all, if you look at the Olympic flame, it never gets blown out, does it? Um, so that I always felt that there was a way to overcome the problems, but we weren't consulted. Um, may I just draw attention to some of the problems that I see on the site that need to be addressed? I think it's going to be said that probably this applies more appropriately in the design stage. Yeah. But I'd like to mention these here so that the people here can appreciate just some of the problems that the architects have. Um, there's the forecourt is uh, approximately, uh, in the old term, four feet or uh, 1,200 millimetres thereabouts above the lawn level. Am I right on that, Brent? Something like that. Um, I believe it's possible to have a design that will be Uh, will appear to be welcoming to you as you walk down the gardens to it. But it must also, and perhaps above all else, must be a, a, a very clear welcome to those who walk across the forecourt. So it's a two-way thing. You've got to design it so it's seen from both directions. And it's got to be accessible. <coughs> and there's an increasing number of us now who find steps difficult. <laughs> Never did I think that I'd find steps difficult. But when you get to 86, somehow they, they do seem a bit um, more of a problem than in the past. Um, so I would plead, and it will be a strong uh, recommendation when it comes round to the design process, Mr. Mayor. Absolutely. That there be a broad, easy gradient ramp that goes from the top to down to the lawn within the floral clock limits where the path has an edging beyond the clock. It can curve from the building down and round to the far side and that ramp can be flanked by a wall which I would li like, and it's my vision, that it could have vertical panels and slots where you see through to the sea and gardens, and the panels would have the names. And as you walk down or up, you'll be able to see the names that have been recorded in a way that has to be 
resolved following the research work that's in hand at the moment by a number of people. And I'm glad to say that there's um, available people or people who have given a tremendous amount of time already <coughs> and it's already identified that there's some, I think, 70 additional names that would need to go up, something like yeah, that. And a lot of spelling mistakes. Mm. Um, and th th <coughs> this has to be done right. Um, as for the flame, it's a very emotive subject. I think we'd be crucified if we said, let's do something else. I think it is done satisfactorily elsewhere. We can do it too. I would like to say that I've thought long and hard about how you can enclose the flame. And then I thought, a better way, surely, is to put the enclosure around it and make a bigger space with the flame within it and a space in which you can have poems and some memorabilia and some important aspects for you to contemplate on. And it might be called the Room of Contemplation. Thank you, Guy. I'm getting the cane now <laughs> because I'm getting into the design aspect. Yes. But I've, I think <laughs> it's very important, Mr. Mayor, for the people who've come here tonight to know that a concept plan that has been presented tonight is no more than that. Mm. It has to evolve right. and take into account thoughts such as this. And I think perhaps, I'm getting the cane already. <laughs> um, I'll leave it at that and say we we'll look forward to further consultation. Yeah. Jonah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we came here tonight to have a look at the three options that have been recommended by the working party. And it seems to me, um, Guy tells us that the, the floral clock site is the only one we should consider. Um, the Heritage New Zealand tells us it's the only one we should consider. The working party says the floral clock is the one that they prefer. I just thought very quickly I'd ask, is there anybody with a different view than that? Well, that seems to be a pretty... Pretty universal a, a, a pretty, approval. A pretty good indication. Now, we've got, we've got time for two more questions. We've got this gentleman here, and then I had promised the question to the gentleman behind. Okay, sorry. We'll make it three. Check. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the one thing Sally or Bill might be able to explain is why the building itself cannot be still be named the, uh, the Napier War Memorial Hall. If you look around the world, um, you talk about um, Amsterdam, the Rye, uh, Barcelona, CCIB, um, Geneva, 160,000 square metres of um, conference center called Polex, Polexpo. Um, in my own, in the city where my family lives, the, the MEC, Maastricht um, Conference Center. So, what is wrong with keeping that name <coughs> of the Napier War Memorial Conference Center? One of the things we're here to do is to get your feedback, and we'll take that on board when we make the decision. Thanks, John. We've got two more questions. The gentleman in the grey sweatshirt hoodie. Oh, there we go. Uh, Fiona, I'll get you to come up. It's the gentleman. Can you just raise your hand, the man that... Yeah, there he is. Thank you. 
So we'll go here first. You have a question? Are you going to answer his question first? I have. Oh, yeah. sorry. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, Mayor Bol Dalton, um, when you were talking earlier, you mentioned the Clive Square, and that would have been your preference. And basically, your indication would have been that if it was up to you in the council, that's where you would have built it. But I think because of public pressure... Excuse me, can I just interrupt you? Not up to me in the council. I gave a personal preference. Mm. That wasn't necessarily the preference of council. Yep, but what, my I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, due to public pressure, this is why we've now had this consultation and this process. So what I'd like to know is, for the concept of the um, memorial, are we going to have consultation with... Um, the public on the design yes. or not? Absolutely. We will be doing draft designs and we'll be going out to consultation with the public. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it, this consultation hasn't happened because of public pressure. No, no, no. No. I, I think it's worth noting this consultation process hasn't happened because of public pressure. It's happened because it's part of council process. It's part of council process. Uh, this I, is the last question. I was just like to ask Guy Natish a question um, about the Conference Centre, the War Memorial Centre, because he um, has batted so well for us and uh, we've got to congratulate him. And um, he's taken us right through, but he also seemed to have a little hiccup as to what the centre should be called. And I think that he favours the War Memorial Conference Centre. Could Guy confirm that, please? My, uh, my preference is strongly, very strongly, that you reinstate the name Napier War Memorial Centre. Yes. And, and my, re my reason is that I believe you need to ensure that it is seen as a complete centre, not two places. Yeah. War Memorial on the right, conference on the left. I think there are problems ahead of you if you don't put this umbrella over the whole project. I could expand on that. Thank you, Thanks for that, Guy. Thank you. We'll take that on board. Thank you very much for your participation and your questions. Now, you do have, uh, you do have the postcards where you're welcome to uh, leave feedback now uh, with the team. There are pens outside if you don't have a pen with you. Uh, up here also is the website address that you would find by going on to the Napier City Council website anyway, and you've got an email address there that you can also email feedback to. So, Thank you very much for your attendance. I'll ask Charles to close the meeting for us. Tēnā tato. We will finish our hui as we have started with a prayer. Kia tō, kia tato katoa. Te atu whai o tō tato ari ki a ihu kraiti. Me te aroha o te atu a, me te whiwhinga tahitanga, ki te wairua tapu, mo ake ake. Amen. Amen.